Do take a seat and do take out your Bibles. We've got three readings this morning. Uh, Valerie's going to read the other two. Do you want to come up, Valerie, so we can do a, a little quick changeover? That'll be great. Um, I'm going to read the first one for you, and then Valerie is going to read the second two. So we're on page five to start with, Genesis chapter three. We're coming in halfway through the passage, really. You remember, God gave Adam and Eve just one rule. They could eat from any tree in the garden they liked, apart from one, and they broke that rule. And so God now announces his punishment on them. Before we read our readings, I'm going to pray. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you that Jesus gave himself up for us. Thank you, Father, for the picture marriage is of this. We pray, Father, you would speak powerfully to us this morning through your word, and we would know how wonderful this truth is. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 14. So the Lord God said to the snake, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labour, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat, eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. I'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 to 33, found on page 1176 in the Church Bibles. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I'm now going on to Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 to 4, on page 1249 in the Church Bibles. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, 
and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Valerie. Morning, everyone. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Uh, This is a profound mystery, but I'm not talking about Peter or Eileen or Andy or Pippa. I am talking about Christ and the church. One of the best parts of my job, I think, is that I get to the privilege of marrying lots of people every summer, good friends, members of the church family. Here's a photograph of uh, one that I did last summer in uh, Shakespeare's church in Stratford. It's a brilliant privilege. The rest of the congregation, they're way back. I'm there right in the midst of the action. Uh, I get to see who had a tear in the eye when they said their vows. Um, I get to see which of the grooms fumbled with the rings over the fingers. It's a wonderful, wonderful privilege. I've actually got a friend, a vicar friend, who slightly shamelessly, at the beginning of every wedding, gets out his phone and takes a selfie of himself and the couple. (laughs) Not as a gratuitous misuse of power... But as a way of saying, just as that that picture, that selfie, that photo is a picture of that marriage, well, in the same way, all human marriage is a picture of something so much greater, the relationship between Christ and his church. Well, welcome to uh, week two of this little mini-series, Thinking About Singleness and uh, Marriage and Sex and Relationships. Last week, we put some really important, crucial, foundational principles in place. Why did God invent marriage? Next week, we're going to think about contentment and singleness. We're going to think about singleness next week. But this week, we're going to think about marriage. And I'm aware, of course, as soon as I say that, that this will be a very painful area for many people here. Perhaps some reflecting on a parent's marriage that wasn't great. Perhaps difficulties in our own marriage. Some, of course, many grieving a lost marriage. Or maybe a lack of marriage that we deeply desire. Well, the aim this morning is to consider this subject in a way that is full of grace and full of realism. And the prayer is that as a church family, we might celebrate both marriage and singleness and support one another in whatever area of life, whatever our relational status happens to be. Now you might find it very helpful to turn to page three on the inside of the service sheets and the way we're going to approach things this morning is to think about the overall storyline of the Bible and what the overall storyline of the Bible says about marriage. So here's a timeline um, on the screen. You've got creation, 
You've got the fall where everything went wrong, as we thought about in that first reading. Death and resurrection of Jesus. The age we live in now, the church. And then the return of Jesus. I should just say it's not to scale, in case you're wondering exactly when Jesus will, will come back. But what does each stage of the story teach us about marriage? What are the practical implications along the way? Well, let's start with creation. Creation. And on the screen, here is the most important verse, I think, in the whole Bible about marriage. Here's the definition. Here's the, uh, the foundation of everything. Here is where it all starts. In fact, did you know this verse is so important, it is quoted four times in the New Testament. It says this. Uh, This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Okay, three things to notice. Notice, first of all, the public nature of marriage. A definitive breaking off. A leaving of one family unit to start another family unit. Isn't it interesting? I don't know whether you've noticed this. How many wedding speeches get this wrong? Um, I've heard so many father of the bride speeches that say to the groom, welcome to the family, which is a lovely thing to say. It's a nice thing to say. But the whole point here is that he's not joining the family. She's leaving the family to start a new unit. There's a danger of just getting off on the wrong foot from the day itself. Uh, Practically, this will mean things like husband and wife taking the initiative for when they see the in-laws. We're the unit now. Being careful not to criticise one another publicly. When the children leave, we're the unit. The priority, not the old family unit, the new family unit. Notice too, not just um, public, but also permanent. Do you remember the old translations? Hold fast. Hold fast. Something actually that Jesus draws out when he quotes this verse speaking to the Pharisees. The conversation is divorce. And Jesus quotes this verse, and he says, what God has joined together, let no one separate. You go to a wedding, and it's easy to think, isn't it, that it's all about the couple. They decided to get married. They made the promises. They made all of the arrangements. And in one sense, that's true. But what Jesus is saying is something much more profound, that marriage is not made on earth but made in heaven. Now, of course, the Bible gives uh, one or two exceptions in the case of adultery and a few other things that we won't get into now. But putting those things aside, the point is, hold fast. Which is quite a big, scary thing to say, isn't it? Just think about this for a second. When someone takes a wedding vow, they are promising to love a stranger. Because nobody can guarantee that our marriage partner is going to stay the same. And so it's a promise to love that person that they turn out to be. Even if that means dementia or something else. Public, permanent, finally physical, one flesh which of course means so much more than sex. There are lots of reasons why in a marriage physical intimacy may not be possible, and that marriage is still a one flesh marriage, but not less than sex. We said last week, here is something that the church is very coy and embarrassed about. That married couples, here is something you need to talk about, assuming this side of the relationship is possible for you. Uh, When was the last time, married couples, that you talked about the physical side of your relationship? Okay, so point one, public, permanent, physical. 
But that is not the end of the story. That's not the way things are now. And point two, the next part of the timeline would say that there is no part of our humanity that isn't ruined by sin. As we saw in our first reading, our first parents mess up. The world is plunged into ruin, and a central part of that is in terms of our relationships. All of which means we shouldn't be surprised if our marriages are maybe what, not what they, we hope they might be. Public, leaving the, whole, the old family's hard work. Sometimes parents put unrealistic ex- expectations on a new couple. Permanent, holding fast doesn't always happen. Do you know how many marriages in this country now end in divorce? Uh, Nearly 50%. It is possible, I think, to be more lonely in a marriage than it is to be more lonely as a single person. Physical. Physical intimacy is ruined. Such that in 1 Corinthians 7... The Apostle Paul actually has to command married couples to have more sex, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 2, because sadly in a fallen world, there isn't as much intimacy in a marriage as there ought to be. Uh, I've put a little screenshot on the, uh, up there about a book that I'd recommend anyone to read. He's been married for a little while. The title is called What Did You Expect? And it's, I think it's a brilliant title. The whole premise of the book is that you are a sinner married to a sinner. You are bound to be selfish. There are bound to be moments of greed and jealousy. But somehow in the heady days of engagement, love is so intoxicating that even the most mature believer forgets what the Bible has to say about human nature. You know, my marriage will be the one marriage in history immune from the effects of the fall. My marriage will be the one marriage in history that doesn't need grace. And then a few years in, you read a book like this, and it says, what did you expect? Maybe you're single, and you think that getting married will solve all of your problems. Well, right alongside the goodness of marriage, and it is wonderful, it's great. The fall, the disappointments, the loneliness, the loss, the pain of marriage. I've done quite a bit of um, marriage counselling in my time, and I find so often that marriage counselling problems are not really marriage problems. They're just plain old sin problems. It's just that marriage has brought the issue to the, uh, the foreground. So don't be surprised if a marriage goes through tough patches. That's what we should expect. But of course, point three, as we move along the timeline, there is one bridegroom who will never let us down. There is one wedding day without any family arguments or squabbles, There is one marriage partner who is pure and blameless and good. Do you know there's one marriage that will never end in death? One marriage where there will never be any difficulties or problems. And so when Jesus first pitches up in ancient Palestine, there's a bloke called John the Baptist. And he describes himself as the best man whose role it is to prepare the bridegroom. Jesus identifies himself as the bridegroom, the heavenly bridegroom. Now, sometimes in wedding sermons, I love to tell the story of how the couple got engaged. So let me tell you about Matt and Becky. There's a hill uh, just outside Cambridge that looks like this. I know it's not really a hill, but by Cambridge standards, that is a mountain. (laughs) And you go up the hill and you get a beautiful view of the city, the spires and the towers. One morning, Matt climbs the tower of St. Andrew the Great and fixed up a big white banner with the words, Will you marry me? He takes Becky for a walk up the hill. Becky, can you see the tower of St. Andrew the Great? She sees the sign and the rest is history. 
Not a bad engagement story. But how about this for an engagement story? On a hill outside Jerusalem, on a hot and dusty day, the king of the whole universe is strung up on an old wooden cross, and with his dying breath, he says to a rebellious world, I love you. Here is love better than the tenderest of moments. That the king of the universe should take all of my uncleanness on himself and make me fit for God's presence. That is quite some proposal. He was a king. She was a nobody. He was good looking. She was a mess. He was a genuinely great guy, the kindest you could ever meet. She was a criminal. But the king, that's Jesus, decided that she, that's the church, was the one for him. He loved the church. And he gave himself up for her. Can you see, this is so much more than saying marriage and family is the goal of your life, but if it doesn't work out for you, Jesus will fill the gaps. He's the main event. This is the capital M marriage. It means, of course, in a healthy Christian marriage, each partner will want to guard his or her devotional life with the Lord. Because time alone with the Lord will always be more important than a shared time of Bible reading or prayer. Because the capital M marriage with Jesus is the marriage to which all little m human marriage points. A picture, a picture of the relationship between Jesus and his church. And that takes us to the next part on the timeline. And can you see as we come to the age of the church, it's not that Jesus' marriage with the church is a great illustration for human marriage. No, human marriage, that's the copy. The heavenly marriage is the model. Can you see what dignity this gives to human marriage? What a thing to be an illustration of. Wow. Wow. Aren't we lucky at St. Thomas's to have so many visual aids around the place on a Sunday morning? Uh, of course, none of us are perfect, but married people, can I, can I plead with you to work really hard at being a visual aid? Can I work really hard at, uh, work really hard at being a picture? Husbands, it says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And the way you do that, according to Ephesians 5, husbands, is by becoming a beautician. That your job is to make your wife even more beautiful on the inside than she already is and prepare her for her ultimate wedding day with Jesus. Do you know when I think of the Lord Jesus, when I think how much he's done for me, I realise there is so much more I should do for Claire. Am I nourishing and cherishing? Am I initiating our service in church? Am I initiating our praying together? Am I making our Christian discipleship our priority? But don't just over-spiritualise either. When was the last time that I took her out for dinner? When was the last time I bought her flowers? When was the last time I did something spontaneous? How's the nourishing and cherishing going, uh, married men? Uh, Wives, how are you doing at encouraging your husband? How are you doing at encouraging his loving leadership? How are you doing at following his lead? He says, let's pray together, you drop everything, because his loving leadership means so much to you. Look at how devoted he is. Look at how much he trusts him. Look at how much he loves her. Look at how much she encourages him. Do you know, it reminds me a little bit of another marriage. Jesus and the church. 
And then, of course, the final stop on the Bible timeline says that one day, all of our relational and emotional needs will be completely fulfilled. Here's that final verse. Then I saw a new heavens and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a, as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. What's, the, uh, what's your favourite part of a wedding? I think, for me, the best part of any wedding is that moment, you know, when the groom's sort of standing at the front and the bride's coming down the aisle, that moment when the groom turns round and looks towards his bride. Well, picture Jesus, as it were, at the, at the front of the aisle of history with that same look of love on his face as he looks down the aisle of history to his bride, the church. In fact, you might say that in marriage terms, death is going to be with your first love. He's the one we want to be with. He's the one we want to please. And so all of our life is focused on that day when the bridegroom returns. And we get to be with him. To be united with him. If you're single, Jesus doesn't fill the gaps in your life because marriage hasn't happened for you yet. Uh, he is not the consolation prize. This is the main event, the wedding day to which the whole of history is looking forward. And if you're married, remember that your marriage is a picture. And your job for the rest of your lives is to walk down the aisle of history together, hand in hand, towards this amazing future. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Uh, this is a profound mystery. But I'm not talking about Ben and Catherine, or Richard or Liz. I am talking about Christ and the church. Let's pray as we finish. praise you, our Father, for the Lord Jesus and his love for the church. Thank you that the whole of history is heading towards a wedding. Pray that we might come to Jesus, be part of that love story, and fix our eyes on him. Praise you too for human marriage, and we pray for lots of visual aids in this church family that make us want to go to heaven and make that eternal marriage very, very attractive to those around us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.